I'm Terry Durden in biology. Uh, this is a graduate student of mine, Leah Good, who's doing her thesis work on flipped classrooms here in Murray State, specifically biology. Um, I am Kristen Erdman, and I teach athletic training and exercise science. Nathan Hertz, uh, math and statistics. Mm -hmm. John Hart, telecom systems manager. And I know it's for Todd, math and stat, and I'm actually on Lee's committee, right? Mm -hmm. So, a uh, <laughs> couple of times uh, I heard about this, like, when it will be inside and wanted to know more. There you go. Have any of you tried flipping a class or part of it? It probably depends on the definition. <laughs> yeah, <Okay. laughs> same here. Yeah, same here. Was that a good experience? or? I, I recorded all of my lectures that I gave for a semester in my in-class model. And I was like, man, I'm, it's at the back of the classroom. They can't really read the board, so that wouldn't do good for flipping. But I never got around to making better videos based on that first set. Okay. So that's where I'm at. Okay. Um, I guess it's probably really not flipping. But I tried to do more. I tried to do more of, you know, watch this video outside of class mm -hmm. so we can talk about it in class mm -hmm. instead of showing it in class. Sure. Yeah. So, but is, I haven't, I haven't cool. tried a lot of the, like the recording lectures yet. Okay. So my purpose is, what it says here, what was posted, <coughs> what is involved in flipping a course, and it doesn't really matter where you are. It doesn't matter if you're in a clinical setting or if you're in a classroom setting, big class, small class. Those are not restrictions. But importantly, strategies and resources that will help you because you can really get into uh, an extreme amount of time and not being prepared for upcoming classes, I think, unless you learn some shortcuts, given our time constraints here. And then for you to look at a flip component for your own course at the end of the workshop. So what I'm not doing is so trying to help you understand what is active learning. What is an active learning course like? We could spend weeks doing that. Uh, if you have questions about that, because that really is at the heart of flipping a course, then go to other <coughs> workshops that do help you learn about active learning and uh, student-centered classes. So I'm assuming you're already on board with that, otherwise you wouldn't be looking at flipping your course, that you're in some way dissatisfied with what your students have been doing, you'll, or you're looking for something better than what you already have. So, what is a flipped classroom? I mean, it depends how you define it. Here you have the passive learning lecture typically in the classroom, and then they process that information, do something with it at home. So how would you change this if you were flipping it? What do you think? Put the learning materials at home, watching videos, reading, what have you, and then apply it mm -hmm. the minute they walk in. It really is flipping, just flipping those two. Oops. Just a mirror image. And um, what's sort of the beauty of a flipped classroom is one of the big concerns faculty have had about implementing active learning is where are they going to learn the content? What about all this, you know, we have this need to tell students all this info, and if I don't tell it to them, then they're not going to learn enough. And with flipping, you can still do that. You can put all the lecturing you want to in your videos, assign it for homework, find a way to make them actually pay attention to it, make it effective, but then work on the part that really students struggle with, which is they can read, they can watch videos, but using it, solving problems, applying it to new situations, that's where they really struggle and that's where our expertise is really needed. So we're making ourselves available for that uh, thought processing, that application in the classroom. Uh, for a moment, I'd like for you to think about your fears. What fears do you have, if any, about flipping? I think you probably just Why don't you be summed a up mine. Pardon? I said I think you probably just summed up mine. <laughs> which is? Which is, um, I, I guess I feel like if I don't, if I'm not the one that they're getting the information from, that they're not gonna, that they're not gonna get it, or that. Even if I'd said to watch a lecture at home, there's 
you know, I'm not there to make them do it. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How how to how to ensure that they are watching the videos, doing what they need to do outside of class, without adding extra burden to my workload. Yeah. Is, is yeah. what I'm most concerned with. Okay. So workloads a big one. Yeah. That's part of the reason I'm doing this to help you with that. Other fears? Actually, just written down virtually what he said. <laughs> <laughs> Also, the, the stress of when they have to apply it in a classroom, you have to be able to answer questions very, very quickly, and you know you, you lose a little bit of control of control. the classroom setting. Control is big. Yes, control is big. So I'm ba back up for a minute. Got uh, for some faculty, what I hear is they're worrying about this piece. What are they doing? Out well, we already don't have control over what they're doing outside of the class. We give them assignments, we tell them to read the book, and they don't do it. We're really not changing. Uh, much about that, but there are strategies that will make it more effective. But the big thing is this, and I would say this is where 85% of our effort needs to go. And mistakenly, some faculty think, well, 85% is going to be getting these videos and everything together, and that somehow this is just going to happen. And it doesn't just happen. This is the big piece to uh, get ready. What are you going to do in the classroom if you don't lecture? And we'll talk about that. So fears, I had these. You didn't really mention student attitudes, but they may not take kindly to the idea of now you're not lecturing, now they've got to pay attention to things outside of class, and they didn't previously perhaps, plus they come into class and you're asking them to work, not just sit there and listen to you, but to think and apply themselves. Some students uh, may not take that so easily. Uh, evaluations. Some faculty are worried about what if the students don't like this and then my evaluations go down. And control, you talked about time, you talked about class size, you didn't mention. Um, I think this addresses that. This is a class of 240 students. This is, you know, maybe this is a problem with the, from the teaching, teaching point of view. Well, it could be a problem in a big lecture course. Uh, at 230 students, it's, it's hard to stop and ask if it's clear or not. Why is that hard to stop? Because it's just a lecture format. You don't see what is happening. And you know, it's not kindergarten. They're adults. So she's finding it difficult to stop and ask students a question in a large like Somehow she's associating problems with, with a large lecture. And some people do have that concern. How am I going to do sorry, how am I going to do active learning in this big classroom? For us, that's probably sixty to eighty students. I don't know about other areas. But how do you obviously you can't be helping every student in that type of class environment. So how do you know that they're on task? How do you know they're getting anything out of it? So we're going to focus on strategies and resources, beginning with the out of class part. What are they doing for homework? That's the passive learning. The continuous droning of lecture is, uh, is a surefire way to kind of uh, kill brain cells, I think. I mean, we, we worry about alcohol, but there's very little going on during the lecture that is remotely accessible to them. Okay, so we're trying to shift that, have the classroom dynamic different from this, and then outside of class that they're actually doing something not, not sleeping. And the strategy is use what's already available. There are so many resources out there, and in fact this is what I see as the time sink. There's so many resources out there I could spend literally a semester just going through resources. And I have done that, and I've had graduate students go through resources for a semester. We never end going through resources. So um, you will, as you go through this process, find sites that you think have quality resources, sort of your first go-to 
So I have a document that has all these links for different topics, and that's my go-to file. Of course, it's getting longer and longer. At some point, I'm going to have to edit it, but there's just so much out there. So there's no reason for you to be making all the videos for them to be using. You can if you want to, but for Sciences, Khan Academy, well, and other disciplines as well. And mathematics stats. Yeah. Is that free? For yes. Mm -hmm. okay. It's free. It's, it's free for everyone. For you. Uh, YouTube. Everything's on YouTube. Annenberg Learner is one you might not be familiar with. Don't do this. It's showing. It is? Oh, I can't see it. Okay. <laughs> so how am I going to scroll down? So if you look here, yeah, right? Look at that. See? Yep. There's your... So it has resources for all disciplines, not just sciences. <coughs> and there are lots of others. And you would need to find out what works best for you. Or make your own. I know if you're familiar with Camtasia, that's a product that you buy. You essentially need a good microphone. Uh, integrity we have here on campus, associated with Canvas. Uh, I switched to Office Mix, Lilia, before she left. In fact, it sat in my email for a year before I finally was willing to. I was so desperate. So the semester was starting, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to look at this and see if it'll help me out. And it, it's so easy. I wish I'd looked at it mm -hmm. when she gave it to me. Office Mix is a free product up to a point from Microsoft. And for me, it's much easier to use than Tegrity. And then you have other resources to mix in with that called Edpuzzle. And Leah's more familiar with that than I am. So I use Edpuzzle a lot because um, it's all online. It's completely free. And what you can do is you can pull different resources into one specific video. So for example, I might find a really great video on YouTube that I like little parts of. Um, and so I'll insert that, but maybe I want um, some of my information in there as well, so I can put in PowerPoint on it. Um, I'm also a Mac user, so it accepts Keynote. I can put in Keynote um, on it as well. And then I'm essentially pulling from all these different resources, and I have one little video that runs seamlessly for them that takes me maybe maybe 30 minutes to put the whole thing you know together. Um, I'm easily distracted, so I'm usually like, oh, well, I can add this too, or oh, well, we'll try, you know. Um, the perfectionist in me, but I really like Edpuzzle, but I do not have a lot of um, experience with Office Mix. I just happen to have found Edpuzzle first, so it's just preference. And Office Mix is like Tegrity. You pull in a video, embed a video in with it. You can add quizzes and so forth, but Edpuzzle sort of allows you to join what's already available with whatever customizing you want to do to it. So and you these can add quizzes in there as well, and it will grade them for you. So, I know that there have been faculty who have spent an entire summer just producing videos for all their classes. You don't have to do that. And your time might be better spent thinking about what am I going to do in the classroom. I'm sure you assign readings out of class. And if you, I have a class right now where I still have students. Uh, it's online and I have a way of seeing how much time they've spent. No time yet. Still at zero. So, how can we increase the effectiveness of reading outside of the class? Well, you can use tutorial readings to make it a little less passive, and I'll show you an example uh, later on. But there are products available that are free, and they are associated perhaps with animations or problems that they work on as they go through it. Uh, there are quizzes embedded into it, so I use a product called Simutex. It's a biological text, but as they the students read the chapter, they're doing exercises at the same time, and it's sort of checking their knowledge as they go through. And then at the end, there are graded questions. And the grade for that, then I can pull straight into Canvas. So instead of it just being read the book, it's a much more interactive assi reading assignment. They get points for it. And you can also have a quiz of your own. You put a quiz on Canvas that tests the reading. But if you were here, we had a speaker at, the, I think, the forum, not this year, but or last year, the year before that. And she emphasized the point that everything you want students to really do, you've got to attach points to. And I had not heard it put that bluntly, that if they don't have points, it's not worth their time. So if you want them to read 
anything, even a chapter in a book, if you don't put a quiz on it or in some way show that it is, it's worth their time, it's worth the points to read, then it's pretty much, I guess, an optional assignment. You can also make your own um, quizzes embedded, again, in Canvas, Office Mix, if you're using a PowerPoint or videos, you can make quiz questions throughout that. And Lee already mentioned that in Edpuzzle, you can do the same thing. Any thoughts or questions about things to do as homework? I look now I'm trying, a, I'll call it a regressive experiment. <laughs> um, I've been trying for several semesters, you know, putting my usual models, exercises to practice, and then this all can. Exercises are, you know, practice skills, develop skills, that sort of thing. They can take them as many times as they like until they make a perfect score. Mm -hmm. It's ten percent of the final hundred point average. The quizzes that were thirty percent, mm -hmm. it was basically the same material, but they were only allowed to take it once. And then uh, assessments, whether they, we do a lot of engineering design type of assessments, or Exam, regular exams, depending on the actual piece of work we're doing. Uh, I had very little luck with, with with the exercises and quizzes being effective, and uh, even with points attached to them. So the experiment I'm trying is to go backwards. And I may, I'm still using every bit of that that's still there. I simply mark it complete or incomplete by looking at whether they went through and did mm -hmm. the work or not. And 100% of their grade. How is exam this semester, which I'm not terribly comfortable with, but I'm really hmm. frustrated. <laughs> well, and you're saying it wasn't successful because of what? Um, exercises, even though they could take them as many times as they want, the students would take them, not all the students, but a, a sizable proportion, 25 to 30 percent, mm -hmm. would take them once and regardless of their scores would leave. Yeah. You know, so obviously they didn't do well on the quiz and they did badly on the exam. And yeah, I could let them go, but I don't like that. Mm -hmm. And so um, this had all built up over about six or eight semesters. And so that's why I'm trying the other way around. Same amount of work, but without, without the incentive of points on the final average. And it um, I'm wondering if the incentive is too low. I used to have my final, students were doing very poorly on my final exam in mm -hmm. anatomy. So I talked to them and they said, well, it's not worth enough points to put the time in. I've got other classes that I need to put. So I increased it and they did put more time into it. I don't know if that would make a difference or not. But they're final. pretty, mm -hmm. that's the whole course final exam. But students seem to be really judging where's, where's the least, least penalty if I don't do the work and where do I need to put it. And, and I guess and that I mindset is what I'm trying this semester because their entire grade is the exam score, and I, I didn't tie myself to one mm -hmm. number of exams, and I said, you know, typically it's five exams. You even if you score zero on one exam, you can pass, you can pass with B or C. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to see what happens with it. They still, all, the exercises mm -hmm. are still out there, so all of the work to do outside of the class is there. I'm just not making it a part of their final average. I don't know, it may, and it may be different disciplines, I'm not sure. I know that uh, at least having, if we, they got a check mark, it's just whether they did or not, it doesn't count for points. I'll still hear from students, well, I don't have a check mark, why not? Mm -hmm. Why well, you didn't do it. That's what I'm hoping. Yeah. Okay. Well, no, we'll make next semester and I'll let you know. Okay. <laughs> I have yeah. one point to make. Um, last semester, I used 100% traditional teaching for staff subjects. I wrote everything on the chalkboard and that took a lot of time for me, and I got a really good comments from the student. Maybe you also mm -hmm. said that way. And this time, uh, it's not completely flip flop. I'm not using any video, but what I have been doing is put the PowerPoint there, mm -hmm. material, and uh, all the data that they need for that chapter and our code. And I asked them to um, read before you come to the class mm -hmm. and uh, implement the R code that uh, I gave to you. And uh, the other day, uh, I spent like r roughly two to three minutes to check if they read the material or not, do you have any question, even not the new material, but one that I already covered. Mm -hmm. 
most of the time the class is so passive. And as for the graduate class, and um, you can see the perspective for undergraduate is different. Mm -hmm. Even you, your expectation is low, right? So that's the problem. I don't know. I have not addressed any point for yeah. grading so far, but for graduate level, um, my understanding is I should not because that's the graduate level course, right? But they, I don't know, in that setting, which one is good? Uh, I thought that uh, what I have been doing right now is better than what I did last semester. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, the outcome is basically the same. I also need to go for everything the same way I did last year, even though my life is a little bit easier using the PowerPoint versus writing. Time. So, and for the undergraduate student, uh, even though the problem that you just mentioned, even though I attached some point there, um, I, really, I don't know how, how to force them to actually spend time on reading. Uh, I asked them, I, I told them, I will take your canvas account and see how much time you spend there. Uh, but this is not the right way to track that. Right? Mm -hmm. so Plus, all they have to do is yeah, open it. They yeah. made down the material open. and do it in some way, not logging into the canvas. Um, so, the question is um, the, the point here is the self motivation, right? Mm -hmm. They need to look at the material the way uh, we are thinking not like forcing them to do this and this and this. The question is how to motivate them to uh, read that kind of reading material before coming into the class. Do they have sufficient time to do that? Even after lecturing 100%, giving 100% they need for, for that particular chapter, mm -hmm. and ask questions, easy questions the other day, they are not ready to answer the question. So well, that's what that speaker was saying, because I used to think the same thing. Why should I? kind of have to put points on everything. Shouldn't they be responsible and yeah. do this? Yeah. Well, for me, it's give that up. That's not the real world anymore. <laughs> and I can sign, I kind of see their logic. If they're, if it's not worth it to you to put points on it, it's not worth much and I'm not going to do it. I got other things I got to do that do have points on them or friends or whatever. There's something attached to it. But in today's, with today's students, they're expecting something with it. And I, I think she's right, because my idea, and for years I thought the same thing you did, are saying, and I was quite frustrated because students don't step up to the plate. But by changing format, and we had a person in the workshop yesterday who uh, re reiterated this, the engagement of students with it being higher, they have better attendance. The students are more involved. They don't get all of them. You're not, I don't know any way to get all of them, but you are getting more of them interested and involved with the material. So I guess one of the questions I would ask you to keep in mind for yourself is, what's my measure of success? I think it also has to do too with what you're doing in the classroom. Because if, if I know that if I do the readings and I'm going to get called on in class and some activity that we're doing, even if there's not points on there, um, I would be more likely to do whatever the outside assignment, points or no points. You know, if there's points, I'm going to have even more incentive. But if, if I'm doing this outside of class and then I'm coming in and then I'm essentially just sitting there, my motivation to do that goes down versus if I have to interact with, you know, the student next to me, I know, like, I have to uphold my end of the bargain when I'm sitting in that class and make sure that I'm prepared for them, not just for me. I think if you can find a way to get them so that they're not just thinking about themselves, that they're thinking about, well, you're actually going to be part of that, you know, an important member of whatever you're doing inside the classroom. That also increases some level of accountability, mm -hmm. other than the, the exam that's down the road. And one problem I, I uh, noticed that, particular in undergraduate class, they don't want to ask the question, thinking mm -hmm. that whether my question is right or wrong, maybe some, someone. Uh, checking the question differently, maybe it's a silly question, wrong question, why should I ask the question, something like that. So, yeah. And I encourage it almost every day, no matter how silly your question may be, uh, it doesn't matter. Just ask me and be an active learner. Mm -hmm. but just like keep pushing that way every day, but outcome is almost zero. <laughs> That's uh, an partly developing an environment for any active learning classroom. So if we talk about in class, we're doing the active learning and processing whatever you had them do outside of class. And you want that to be an environment where they're in, 
talking with each other, asking questions of you and their peers. And um, you could flip a whole course, or you could flip parts of your course. One of the things I'll say I think is more difficult if you flip part is students get used to being the passive, listen to the lecture, and then you walk in one day, okay, today we're, we're doing the flip classroom topic, and you're to be engaged and asking questions and so forth, and they're like, no, I'm not. So it can be difficult to train your students in a way to go back and forth yeah. between those and, two. And the timing also for start 135, we need to cover like chapter 1 to chapter 20. <laughs> it's really, goes really, really fast, right? So. The way you just list it, like one day theoretical traditional version, version versus next day flip class. Um, it's like, how can I manage the 19th chapter to be covered for every sentence or something like that? So. Well, that's where having your resources ready before you say I'm going to flip a class uh, is something to think about. So, in class, uh, what are some types of activities that you think of as potential ways to engage students in class? What department again, are you in? Again, we, sorry. sorry. Oh. What department? Uh, College of Education and Human Services. Okay. Your name is? Uh, Echo. Echo oh. Wu. Echo. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, about this, uh, how about doing group activities? Mm -hmm. Collaborative work? Group work. So uh, is the, um, for, for both my graduate and undergraduate class, I uh, present the main, the objective of that day lecture, for the question here and give them like two, three minutes to think about it. But I, this time, already asked them to read this slide from this slide to this slide, and I pick some question from that kind of slide. So um, partially successful in that uh -huh. point, but it's, it's a bit more interactive, uh, but like percentage is not that big. But so you're asking them to, to yeah, think yeah. about a question? No, no, I put the question. Okay. The main objective of that yeah. the mm -hmm. discussion, and I want to say if they already did the slide or not, and mm -hmm. if they answer how correct they are to answer precisely or not. Okay. So, so questions? Uh, question from the reading. Mm -hmm. Do two things that work well and they're really related. The first one is small groups out of 27 people, I'll break them into groups of three mm -hmm. typically, and pose either the same question or related similar questions to all the groups and then take half periods of like that and then let them summarize, give them two minutes to summarize their solution and they can all they ask questions and react. That works well once I get them over that hump of I'm terrified of standing up from the Is this a problem, kind of, a problem this is, solving? Typically, yeah. This is some sort of, problem. I do network design. And so this will be, you have these sites here with requirements. Mm -hmm. How would you solve the problem? Yeah. Okay. What we're talking about. Um, the other one, if it's more just straight skills learning, like network loading calculations or something. Mm -hmm. I'll just do it as a game, Jeopardy or something like that, and build a PowerPoint Jeopardy thing. You know, yeah. Play it that way. You know, so they, so it's they still a problem solving. Problem first, yeah. yeah. Game, yeah. problem solving. It didn't work well. Okay. Other ideas? I of think uh, one, another thing is very similar to the play games um, is the role. Yes, role, role playing. Play. Yeah. And I was teaching uh, in Hong Kong, teaching those kindergarten teachers, and they loved uh, the role play in groups, and they design wonderful role plays. Mm -hmm. Others come to mind? So many case study analysis? Yeah, case studies. There are lots, and if you Google active learning uh, strategies, you're going to find so many websites that just have all of these. And that's where the burden is on you to get up to speed on how, what's available, what are common strategies, and there's no lack of information, and then learning what are the common pitfalls, I guess, would be one way to go about it, and thinking about what's easiest for you to implement given the resources that you've found.
but there are strategies for all of, of these and you can take any of those and turn them into teacher-centered classroom. You can turn it back into a passive. The students are doing something, but they're not really minds-on. Can anyone think of an example of that? How you could take an activity or a problem and turn it from student-centered student back into teacher-centered. Your example, using a case study where I do all the analysis. Mm -hmm. Or you give them the problem, here's what you do in step one, here's what you do in step two, step three, in a lab, laboratory, you know, students are used to, you tell me, one, two, three. They're not thinking, they're just like the cook following the recipe. Uh, and you're looking for, you're trying to develop those critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, uh, communication skills, so they have to become the center. And that is a big challenge, because we're not comfortable doing that. We're used to being the center. I don't want to get off topic with this, but every time active learning comes up, I teach half of our enrollments online. Mm -hmm. And so all of our three and four hundred level courses have to be offered online. And the question when we start discussing you know, good learning techniques and how do you keep students involved, the question always comes, kind of, how do you do that yeah. online? And that's other workshops. Okay. So I'm not gonna go into that, but that is a challenge. And people have talked about strategies. I have not had much success with I have not had real success with discussions online with uh, lower level biology classes. Uh, we keep trying new strategies. And I went through boot camp here and learned what I could, but one and it's not an active learning technique so much as just kind of a seatbelt against active learning, if you will is I stopped trying to think of a class period as a unit of material. You know, I look at what we're teaching and if, you know, this concept fits 20 minutes and this one takes 15 minutes and this one takes eight, whatever, I'm just going to tell here, then that may be my class period. But to make sure that we stop if there's something to engage students, if they do something and I'm not the one standing up talking. And that's mm -hmm. part of the skill of working with active learning classes. How do you, it's that, not that. Giving up a control and structure and allow, taking an advantage of what we call learning opportunities. So a student asks a question and like, wow, that's a good question, but I can't do that because we gotta do this, which I just did with your case study. <laughs> right? Recognizing where, how can I use what the students generate it's so much about letting students uh, put out their thoughts and then working with those thoughts. So I'm sure you've heard that you're a facilitator instead of a leader, the guide on the side. Or is that right? Guide on, guide on the side. side instead of the sage on the stage. <laughs> uh, there's skills to doing that. So we, as I mentioned before, if I don't lecture, what am I going to do? Big challenge. These are ideas on addition to those. Clicker questions, I'm sure you've heard of that, and you can use those in lots of different ways. There are lots of sites. I will say that it is difficult to find good clicker questions. You're looking for questions that, again, develops problem solving skills, critical thinking skills, and not just spit back. There's all sorts of what's the definition, this, this, or this, So, and that's easy for publishers to throw out there. Uh, it can take a lot of time to either write your own or find, but there are resources out there. Starting Point is another one. This is for economics, and you can see they've got all these modules for engaging and motivating students, and they're a pile of them. So within your disciplines, I'm sure you can find similar resources, and one of them is classroom response systems, so they're talking about use of clicker questions there. Uh, with clicker questions, there's lots you can do with that. You can put up a question and then the students buzz in their answers and uh, say, okay, now I want you to talk to the, your neighbor and discuss your answers, convince the other person that your answer is correct, or maybe you both have the same answer, maybe you don't, and then have them buzz in again so you make it interactive. You can have questions with more than one correct answer where there's a more correct, a partial correct answer and a more correct answer and it's tied points to it. And if you think about it, if you have questions at the beginning of class, middle of class, and end of class, what you ask in those can be quite different. So sort of uh, lower level question, lower level, lower order 
thinking questions initially, but by the time you get to the end of the class session, you may be asking synthesis questions, evaluation questions, more sophisticated questions that pull together what you've been working on. So like in exercise science, it might be just simple kind of spit back questions about uh, either some ana anatomy part or some process, but by the end, giving them a problem it's, and asking how would you analyze this movement or something like that. Another example is the news, New York Times. They have resources for everybody. This is an example with, oops. This is an example with music and lots. They have all kinds of items that you could tie into what you do in class. And case studies, you mentioned here we have the National Center for Case Study Teaching. There are hundreds and hundreds of case studies. Look for similar sites that relate to your particular teaching area. They give us the uh, materials that the students need. They have a lesson plan telling you sort of if you want to follow it, how you could structure that case study depending on how much time you have. They have the uh, answer sheet for the faculty member. So, so much has been developed now, and it really is quality. You just have to find it. And those also have reviews, too. So, for example, um, I teach the 105, 101 lab, so it's essentially biology for non-majors. And I'll go through some of these case studies just to make it relative to them, right? Because they're already sitting in my class hating being there because they think that it has nothing to do with them. Um, and you can look at reviews. You know, some, some might say, you know, this didn't work very well for, you know, this non-major class that I did, but it worked really well for my majors or, um, you know, we ended up cutting out, you know, this portion of this case study because it was just confusing the students <coughs> more than really. So the reviews help a lot too if you're trying to implement it for the first time. If you can find sites that have reviews and they're not that common, that is a real plus. We want to bookmark those. So sort of to summarize, figure out what topics you want to flip, whole class or not. Locate your outside sources, your videos or readings, whatever you're going to do, assign to your students outside class, and how are you going to do that? Are you going to use quizzes or build on it in, um, in class? Incentives for students to complete the work, and then in-class activities. And this is the big one. I know it's just one of these four, but this is the one that probably take the most time, in many disciplines will take the most time to develop. One place to start is a website called Flip Classroom Workshop. And it's a whole website of resources. You yeah, they do, um, they do online workshops. Um, and this is for, you can do, you know, you can be flipping a K-12 classroom, you can be flipping a higher education classroom. Um, but they have a weekly email, right? So if you enter your email in there and subscribe, it's a weekly email. The um, email that I got this week was eight great free resources for flipping your classroom. Um, they, you know, the email isn't coming to your inbox every day or anything like that, but it's just, it's sort of your one go-to if I'm trying to implement a flipped classroom, how do I go about it? And what have people done before that backfired or worked out great? It's all right there on one website. And so our overall strategy here is how can we make it what you do effective, but also how can we save you time in trying to make this change in your teaching. So we're going, I'm going to ask you to think about something that you teach now and what you would do if you were going to flip it. And here's my example for the topic cell replication. Let's say that right now I tell them read the chapter, and then they come in, and I'm going to lecture over that same material. I'm going to ask them questions as they do just because I'm used to doing that. And of course, I'm going to use diagrams to show so that they see visually what I'm talking about. In my flip classroom, instead of signing the chapter, I'm going to use, I've looked online for tutorials that I think are on topic. and of high quality. So this is Arizona has the biology project and they've put it all together already. They've got all the material that I need and they have questions for the students to answer as they go through it. So that works for me. 
and then I'm, they're going to complete a Canvas quiz that has point prints on it after they do that. So that's the content part. Then when they come into class, I know I already know they don't get it when I talk, so I have nothing to lose. I use, and this is a class, non-majors class she's talking about, so there's probably 70 to 80 students. I can use chromosome beads, and we don't have a magnetic board here, but the white, our whiteboards in class are. I can put this on there and it just sticks. Draw a cell, put some more chromosomes, this is a chromosome. Put some more chromosomes in here. Call on somebody, they don't know who I'm going to call on, come up here and move them wherever they're supposed to go next. Call on another student to come up and do it. And the rest of the class should be critiquing, you know, do they agree with what they did or do they not? Are all 80 students paying attention? I can't guarantee that, but I can't know that, you know, they're sitting there sleeping when I'm talking. So, hopefully they're more engaged. And then, so that's sort of like a demo that's not so involved. Then I have bags of these little twist ties that represent chromosomes. Each pair in the class gets a bag. They can do this pretty quickly. They're used to working with their partner. And they start uh, doing this uh, mitosis, moving the chromosomes at their desks, and I'm moving around. If they have questions, stop by, and they work through it that way. And they do have a better understanding than just, they just don't get it when they stand there for this process. So that's what I'm going to do. On your sheets, you have a table. So think about whatever. It could be just one topic, it could be a class session, it could be whatever you want it to be. What's your model at the moment? What are you having them do out of class and then during class? And then what would you do differently if you flip it? I would encourage you to think about how some level of accountability for whatever you put down for the students. Do you consistently do quizzes or do you mix up what, what that kind of accountability piece is? Yeah, it could be like just a muddiest point. Yeah. You know, at the end of it, what was the concept most difficult? And that's a check, you know, check try and be creative with what I ask. Or they have to pose a question, turn in a question at the end of class. 
something. Sometimes asking for quest exam questions and then actually using exam questions with an answer based on what they did that day. change that what I'm implementing right now, but um, in terms of giving like outside the class material is the same thing is what I'm thinking. Like uh, as I'm reading material from the textbook or um, PowerPoint slide that I put there or some uh, reading material outside the textbook. Mm -hmm. And uh, probably uh, I'm thinking to make a group of three or four uh, and uh, give them same or different quiz, mm -hmm. um, and uh, they basically the group work mm -hmm. to answer that quiz. Maybe same, maybe different. If it is different, then uh, quiz the mm -hmm. question and and <coughs> put them involved in the discussion, mm -hmm. and also add at some points because maybe that's the motivating factor. There is five percent, ten percent for the quiz, and quiz is not about this like your mm -hmm. group discussion. What what's the outcome? Now doing Again, you're looking just for that an hour <coughs> shift, not everybody. Whatever. Okay. Um, I had uh, where I said before, watching the videos in class, watching uh -huh. them outside of class, and then um, having a discussion question for them to respond to based on watching the video mm -hmm. um, and then try and do a little bit more role play in class mm -hmm. with some of the concepts that they should have gotten from watching the video. Yeah, and there's so many materials out there for essay science. Yeah. Lots and lots. I think everybody, I don't know about maths. I, I would think uh, you all have all it, kinds it's of stuff. Somehow, but like uh, in terms of what you demonstrated before, mm -hmm. the comedy and something like that. Not that much. My, my like, impression, I don't know if there are a lot of people that I have not tried yet, but I doubt there are a lot. The point For math, I would just think about math. Stat, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I will a lot of good Khan Academy videos. Like, and depending on like um, what level I'm teaching, maybe give them a really good um, data, mm -hmm. interesting question it has in it, and motivate them to analyze it, and give the results on but it's not like every day I can implement that mm -hmm. kind of mini project instead of giving one big three or four short one but covering different areas potentially. Mm -hmm. But um, this is, I guess, doable for uh, class size 15 or 20. Mm -hmm. um, but again, for STAT 135, I have 45 students there, and even the group work uh, of five is a lot. A group of five? Yeah. Yeah, that's big. Uh, that's big, that's right? Big. And I don't know how to implement that, like, flip flop class in terms of uh, knowing whether they are doing their part or not. Well, you'll find out when you test them on it. Or if you have a product that they're turning, the groups are turning in at the end of class, whether it's their solution or discussion or quicker questions along the way where they're clicking in that they understand concepts. Some sort of, again, accountability as they're going through the process. But, but I don't know, group of five. Is, I usually won't use some that big because some people are always left out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's another issue. <laughs> um, before I get to the others, I was going to wrap up with uh, watch out. But you're going to go in there and do these things, but you really don't know how to use them. Do your homework. 
How many people have you heard that said, yep, I tried, that didn't work? Well, maybe they didn't do their homework. Right? There's lots of good success stories for people who have been knowledgeable. And this is what I really worry about, not identifying your resources ahead of time and you are kind of committed to this flip classroom and find yourself, oh my gosh, I don't have time to do this for tomorrow's class. I don't know what I'm going to do in class. So really think about your time constraints before you jump into it. And example of type of thing that's out there, I suspect for other disciplines as well, this is a textbook. Um, evolution and ecology and it's like a book they read this but as they read it they run into little things that they have to do so this is something about caterpillars replicating and they're going over the caterpillars are doing whatever they do over there and then they have questions that they will submit it goes in automatically to a great book that I can pull into canvas and that's how they work through this so it, it's a much more intense reading experience and I look for these quality products. Uh, this module costs students $8 to buy, so it's a lot cheaper. We don't use textbooks in this class anymore. We have them purchase modules on specific topics. Go ahead. 